Here we are, season two of uh, <coughs> Spinners of Yarns with uh, the original uh, Mr. Barry Mooncourt from South East London, uh, uh, the artful dodger of the acid house scene, uh, <coughs> Chelsea fan, and probably most well known for Flowered Up. How are you doing, Barry? Are you in Thailand at the moment? Yeah, I'm. I'm good, raw. I'm. I'm doing fine. Yeah, I'm actually in Pattaya, Thailand, at the moment. All right, so weather, weather's good. Slowly. Yeah, yeah. So I, when, <coughs> where, 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 where were you born? Are you in South East London? No, originally South West London, Battersea. Okay. To the age of two. Yeah. And then my mum and dad thought better of it. We give him a proper education and move to a nice part of South London, Croydon, which was a nightmare for them. <laughs> so what, what year was that then, the, the early 60s? Uh, spawn in 60, uh, 64. <laughs> so, uh, no, originally, the house what we were staying in got demolished and uh, yeah. made way for the Doddington estate. Yeah. So they decided to send all the riffraff out into the suburbs, which your yeah. mum and dad thought would be a great idea. But it all backfired on them in a big way. <laughs> <laughs> so how come you never ended up supporting Palace then? Well, to be honest, they would always be local team. Yeah. My mum's uh, cousin actually played for them, Martin and Paul Inchelwood. Yeah. But like, when you're born in Battersea, your granddad and your old man put it in your DNA. You have no choice. And the thing was, I was always in the second division. Yeah. So never ever thought we'd get to the situation where we are now. So every day's a bonus the way they play. Well, not at the moment. They're playing the toilet. <laughs> yeah. But back in the days in the 70s, early 70s, always second division, playing teams like Wrexham and York City. Middlesbrough. Now, that was higher up than us. <laughs> so, you kind of like, so when, when did you become interested in football then? Oh, from the eight, the first game I can remember yeah. was the uh, 73 Cup final. I think that was Newcastle, Liverpool. Yeah. And I think um, Liverpool, no, Liverpool won that 1 0, I think. Yeah. And then watching the Poland-England game with my old man for the World Cup qualifiers. The game where we got knocked out and didn't make it for, I think it was Germany, 74, West Germany. I think that's yeah. the earliest mem memory I can remember of watching a football game. And then I was allowed to go. My mum used to let me go. I think I was the age of... Um, first game was 1976, December 76. We played Wolves at home. Three old second division, yeah, freezing me bollocks off it. It was that cold, and um, just got into it ever since then. And um, slowly, you meet your family over there, your pals. From I've got pals now I've known for 40 odd years, they're stronger than family, yeah. um, and it just sort of just progressed from there from being a little kid standing on the terrace in. To get to a stage running around. <laughs> that was a long time ago. But he, uh, yeah, it he... was a long time ago. We got balls talk for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, when uh, did you, uh, were you into music as well at the same time? Not really. I think my first record I can remember buying would have been Magnus, One Step Beyond. Yeah. And the specials, uh, the beat, um, Selector, mostly Scar. 79 then. 79, 78, I can remember going to a club in Catford. Um, what was it called? The Squire. Right. And... I was underage then. Right? If you were underage, you had a um, blue card, I think, or it was a pink card, so you couldn't buy alcohol. <laughs> and if you had a, what was it, a green or a red opposite card, you were allowed to buy alcohol. And I'm, it was just crazy, like. 
getting but, it done up in your toe. But, but quite, quite, quite early doors, you started going uh, into railing, didn't you? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, I think it was five pounds for a personal ticket. You buy one, you get a ticket free. But like where, where Chelsea were out of Europe all the time, the closest we ever got was early 80s by travelling away of England. And I think yeah. the first time I actually left the UK, I was 16, and I went to the World Cup in 82 with my mate Beardy. Spain. And that was an experience. I think it was 16 years old then, 16, 17. And uh, he made beard, he used a, he lasted two days out, went home. <laughs> so I was stuck there with these fellas from Cholton for the old three weeks. And it was just like, um, for a 16 year old, first time out of the country, it was just amazing to see how much chaos and, and just all the madness going on. I just got hooked on that. But you, you, you kind of like you, you, you didn't get that opportunity of following Chelsea until overseas until a bit later on. Yeah, the last time, the last away game I went to in Europe would have been uh, just before I got banged up. So that would have been about oh eight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can't remember. There have been so many, um, and they were stories and. To get along yeah. with as well, it was just like yeah. me, Joe, and Ian. We class ourselves as the three sisters. <laughs> and um, there's a mad story. Well, it's just the one that sticks out the most was um, in Monaco. Yeah. Um, Real Madrid had a Super Cup. Yeah. On an August bank holiday, and that was '98. So we decided. I used to work for the Evening Standard then. So I pulled a blag and I said, look, can, can I borrow you one of your vans? Because I'm moving house. So we chawed, borrowed one of their vans, loaded it up with diesel, me, Joe and Ian, and we drove down to France. Um, I knew it was going to go as soon as we arrived there. But as soon as we got to Calais, loaded up the vehicle with Nick Booze from one of those supermarkets. Yeah. And um, that was just mad. We ended up stopping in the Alps, a place called Sisteron, a little village, and we checked into this hotel and um, thought, fuck it, we'll go out for a drink afterwards. And we got back um, early hours, and it's one of those places where all the keys are held up on, on the, um, behind the jump. So we grabbed our keys and, and another set of keys. And... Lucky enough, the room what we chored the keys were right opposite us. So <laughs> we opened the door up. Me, Johnny, and bowled in there. Um, that's a bit, a bit of a liberty. Like one of the boys had pistoled in a fella's bed. I've opened up his wardrobe and grabbed every single bit of club he could think of. So, gone back into our room. I was like, Joe, do you like this one? I'm trying this on. Suede jackets. No, nah, I don't like that, Baz. Ripping it up. So in the end, every bit of clobber was ripped up. And I thought, I'll f dump this lot. So I run down the stairs, pitch black, walked about 10 yards, chucked it over a little brick wall. <clears throat> so the next morning, we've jibbed out the hotel, and as we walked along to the motor, this little brick wall, you could see all this rip club in front of the garden bit. It was in front of the old bill shop. <laughs> so anyway, we, we've drove down to um, Monte Carlo, um, on the black of trying to jib these hotels, making out which we've got these snide press passes. And in the end, we've, I think we tried about six hotels. So look, we're from the Evening Standard. We're booked in here for six nights, blah, blah, blah. And most of them said, no, we'll not receive the fax. So one of them said, okay, if you can resend the fax, we'll get your room prepared. So... At the time, I spoke to my missus and I had this evening standard headed paper. So I said to her, look, fax this hotel that was staying here for six nights, blah, 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 and we'll forward on the invoice on payment. So we said, look, in the meantime, we use this restaurant over there. You can go and wait over the road in our restaurant. So we've gone over there, 
just having a little drink, and he's come running over this bit of paper what the missus have faxed him. He said, oh, I'll upgrade you to our penthouse suite. I said, no, we're, we're okay, just a standard room. He read the facts and the missus put in, oh, you're due to stay at this hotel for six nights. Don't forget you're due back in London to interview Alex Ferguson at Soho House in Soho Square, the Football Association. <laughs> well, the guy who owned this hotel was a Man United fan. He couldn't do enough for us. So um, I thought, fuck it, that's, that's cush, Steve. He's fucked off. And I said, the two right, we're in here. So I called the waiter over. I said, right, we'll have the dearest bottle of wine you've got. And I think the fellow was sitting behind us and he stood up. I thought, oh, shit, he's come on top already. And he's come over. He said, look, this, this is my restaurant. I'm in, in conjunction with the hotel. He said, I've got my own private collection. He said, if you want to pay over 200 um, euros a bottle of wine, you're more than welcome. So I like, thought, in for a penny, in for a pound. So called him over, like, the fucking waiter's come up with his fancy bottle. So, um, and we're just signing for the mills and everything. So we was taking our pals out three, four times a day, Malcolm and a few others, signing for all this fancy French food. I think each meal was coming to about six, seven hundred euros. Right, taking a piss. And um, the day of the match, it was me, Joe and Ian, we're walking around the promenade. And I don't know if you've been to Monaco or France, you've got these little bikes called pooches. Yeah. yeah. If you pedal them and push a button, they start up. So we're walking up this pedestrian zone and uh, me and say, oh, f there's one of those pooches, we're going to go and nick one. So Ian's got on, got on it, started up, come and pick me up. And we just f and left Joe there on his talking to these Germans. So all of a sudden I said, hey, stop, stop. He said, what? I said, there's another one. So we nicked another one, come back, pick Joe up. And by this time we've been around a few bars with a parallel. So we're, we're doing the Grand Prix circuit. Oblivious to us, we could hear all these police sirens and didn't re realize. So, and as you go up, I don't know if you know the Grand Prix circuit, there's a bit what they call the casino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got up this little wheel around, little roundabout. I said, Joe, stop, stop. He said, well, there's another one. I said, well, all that one each. So as I've jumped off, it, jumped off the bike, I went running across the road and old Bill just knocked me flying. I got nicked. Joe and Ian um, got away and I was in uh, Monaco, Monte Carlo police cell, just causing chaos down there. <laughs> anyway, um, about 20 minutes of being banged up, the doors opened. It was full of old Bill. And they said, what's happening? We see you earlier and everything. He said, oh, he said, where's Jerry? And I said, oh, they managed to get away. He said, what have you told these I said, look, I, said, I was on my way to the stadium and I got lost and I asked these two fellas the way to the stadium. And they asked, oh, it's okay, you can jump on the bike. I said, the next thing I knew, they told me to get off and these cunts run me over. He said, okay, listen, I'll, I'll get you out and should be able to get to the game, which give him, um, I got out okay. okay um, so go to the match and everything. <clears throat> so by this time, we, we've um, been in the hotel about five times, sort of five times. And it was time to cough before they could come on, before it come on top. So we're sitting in there. About six o'clock in the evening, me, Joe, Muggsy and Ian, we said, oh, we go now. No, no, we go later. I said, oh, so me and Joe put all our bags on our shoulders and off down the corridor, went down through the service lift and out through the kitchen, put the bags in the mouth. And as I've looked around, I sort of see a little red pop around this door. I said, Joe, I think it's come on top. I said, look, you wait there. I'll go back and get Mal and E. So as I've gone upstairs in the room, I could hear people talking in there. I thought, oh, they're still in there. As I've walked in there, it was the uh, the hotel manager, the chef who sees us run out the kitchen door, and the geezer who owned the restaurant across the road. And they grabbed hold of me. I thought, oh, you know, saying, look, you 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 owe us about twelve to fifteen thousand euros. The bill was, and um. And grabbed hold of me and said, right, we're calling the police. I thought, 
I only got out of the cells 12 hours ago. I can't be fucking having it in there again. So they dragged me down to reception. I started calling the gaffers and everything. And that split second, Joe walked past the entrance. I said, oh, there's me mate. I'll get him and come and pay you. And within, I don't know, half a second, I let go. Back, I was out the door, mate. <laughs> that was just one of them. many stories with me, Joe and Ian. Um, but traveling in Europe, was great yeah. with Chelsea. Never been there previously with Chelsea. Yeah. And I think the first game we played was, um, that was 94. We played away in Prague. Back. Um, quite a bit when I'm there. Um, <clears throat> that's, that, some of those stories I'll keep quiet about that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, go, going back to the, the early 80s, which was your first away game then? With Chelsea. First away game would have been um would have been seventy seven. Um no it wasn't seventy seven. I wasn't allowed to go any away games. My mum wouldn't let me. I think it was nineteen eighty, away to Watford, when Chelsea right. had the away fan bang. Yeah. And my mum said to me, look, you can't go to any away games. So I said, oh, I'm going up with my pals Saturday afternoon. I'm going to stay with him. So anyway, I went away to Watford. I felt oh, I was 15. That's right, yeah. I was a member of that, right? Because um, I'll let you know why. <clears throat> I travelled up to Watford. And was all Chelsea fans were banned from any away games. Quite a few went up there. And they pulled down the side of the stadium to get in. I thought, well, that's a touch. As I went to walk in, you know, Bills grabbed me. And nicked me. And because you're under 16, your mum and dad's got to come and bail you out. And I think yeah. it was about eight o'clock. They just let me out. So I travelled all the way from Watford, all the way back to South London, knocking on my mum's door to come in. No, no one's in there. So I'm sitting on my doorstep. The old Bill called me old man and my old dear up to go all the way to Watford to come and bail me out. The old fuckers already let me out. I've got home... No old man beat the shit out of me. I wasn't allowed to go out for fuck. I think he fucking you know, um, gave me about a month's bang <laughs> from going out. And so that's one of the earliest away games I can remember. So be it's kind of like you. I mean, was there a firm at Chelsea at that point, or was it all different different areas? So, sorry, Rob. Was there a firm at that point at Chelsea? Was it? Organised or was it just different? South East London, Bromley, or South West? There was Patsy. all little firms from everywhere. To be honest with you, yeah. Like, uh, later, when we grew up, our little lot of sort of Streatham, Norwood, Sellers, Crystal Palace. Uh, we had a good little firm then, and it sort of all didn't really sort of combine to about eighty three, eighty four. Yeah. Um, the casual scene then, um, but over Chelsea, you had two little firms. You had all this, all the racist lot, yeah. that C eighteen and all that little lot. Then you had our little lot, and we would never combine. If anything, we've had more rounds with each other than in probably any other club. But right. yeah, it's been, a, been quite a few times like, when we they turn on us and we turn on them. Um, it's probably still like that now. Yeah. A um, couple of my mates won't have it with them at all. I, I won't really. Um, yeah. But that, that's been there sort of since the early 70s. Yeah. And um, I think it was just growing up from the early days in the 70s as a kid, meeting kids your own age and sort of growing up with them. Yeah. Seeing them every game and making friendships and your pals will know him and then they know him and they've all come together. Yeah. Um, and getting the and getting and the been a few times I've been come unstuck. Yeah, I was going to say getting the trains back as well. You you'd recognise somebody from the week before who, who was a, a Chelsea fan. Yeah, and, it was just like you, um, you build up friendship over the years and everything. And yeah. um, it was a case of like there were some games you never knew if you were going to come home. Yeah, this is uh, prior to Hillsborough and everything. There's been quite quite a few occasions. Yeah, when you've been stuck in pushes and rushes to get through turnstiles, your life yeah. is could just go just like that. Yeah, um, 
I think that's why my old dear used to sort of ban me from going, but she used to see all the news and all the trouble and everything. She said, no, you're staying at home. You're not going to those fucking matches. <laughs> what about socially drinking? When did you start drinking alcohol, that is? And where? Where were you drinking? I can remember the first time I got pissed. I was 11 years old. In junior school, me and my yeah. mate. Uh, oh, Mark, Mark Colton. We used to go around his house for lunch break, and his old man had one of those nice little 70s bars plotted up in his living room. Yeah. So one, one home lunch time, we decided to fucking try everything, went to school, pissed, and had to be waiting till the old dear come home and collected us. But not really been a big drinker. Um, I think. So really didn't really start going to the pubs when I was about 15 with me. 50p pocket money a week. <laughs> Have a couple of light owls. <laughs> then fuck off at home. Down the old Kent Road? Yeah, that was that was our um, top spot. And it from, I think, from 81 to about 85. Samson's. Um, the best one was the Royal Oak down Tooley Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Willow's. Um, they were the main ones, but the Oak down Tooley Street, if anyone knows that, then, then they know the place. Um, oh, what's the DJ called there? Um, Holloway. Yeah, yeah. Special branch. Yeah, he used to do um, the Royal Oak. Um, is it Paul Holloway? Nicky. Nicky Holloway. Nicky Holloway, that's it, yeah. And... Um, he used to play one of the last songs. Um, oh, that Lulu song. Shout. That's it, yeah. <laughs> In the end, he used to just stop it. <laughs> we, used to, we used to cause chaos in there. And be a few times as well, we'd come back from um, some European oysting trips. Yeah. And leaving a Friday night at Dover, um, Victoria, get the boat train to Dover go over to Germany and everything, do a bit of oyster and come back straight to the Oak on Tudor Street with a load of gas and everything and just gas the place for the fun and see how good the gas was. <laughs> so you kind of like, if, if you, you're going out uh, central London, you, 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 I, I suppose Tudor Street was the closest you were going or were you going into Soho? No, not at the time. There was a couple of times we went to Legends at Charlesby, um, Charlesby Avenue, I think it was, just at the back of, no, back of Regent Street. Back of Regent Street, yeah. Yeah, um, not Maddox Street, just off Maddox. I can't remember the, remember the street. Um, but mostly it was South East London. And yeah. that, that little crowd we had around there sort of progressed through the um, 80s to the mid-80s to Spectrum and Shum and yeah. that sort of crowd. And just sort of where we are now. Yeah. It was a, so it was a little elite crowd around South East London. Yeah. Um, not everybody got on with each other, but it was always that same crowd. If a new club was opening or bar in South East London, it'd be sort of that exclusive little crowd. It yeah. all the same. Was sort of everybody knew each other. You had the Woolworth Road lot, um, Bermondsey, um, the Borough. And our little lot, um, as I said, a lot of time we didn't get on with each other. We had loads of fights all, all the time with that little lot. Yeah. It was all part and parcel of drinking in the early 80s, coming at Samson's or, or wherever, Willow's, and just giving it, ooh, 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 war, war, just running up the streets, having pitch battles with whoever we could. <laughs> so what about ecstasy for the first time, Barry? When, when did that come about? Right, the first time I had an E, this is mad because <laughs> you're going to love this. It was, um, do you remember, 88, the playoff game at, when we had Borough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it all kicked off? Yeah. So Maisie told me about Spectrum on the following Monday. So one minute we're all on the pitch and everything, throwing rocks and kicks out of each other. And I knew it was little firm from Borough. And when we was on the pitch, I, I bowled up to him. I said, look, are you down here for the weekend? I said, my pal's laying on his deal on Bank Holiday Monday um, down at Evan. Um, and this is mad. All these rocks and people's kicking 
chat room. We're just talking through the fence, having a little chat. And um, they said, no, we're going home. So they never come back. I went down on, I think it was the first all day. But Easter and um, my pals have been um, coup IB for before that and um, doing the pills. And I remember Beardy coming up to me, he said, hey, Baz, have one of these. He only give me half. I think, oh, fuck knows what it was like. I know, all I can remember was white. Yeah. Um, and me, I was fucking gone. I think at the time, they were a pony of pill. Yeah. That's what a tight only gave me half. <laughs> so that was the first time I experienced um, pills and everything. And just got the buzz from there, from from the old sort of... You walked into Spectrum that time, Evan, and it was just like, wow, what the fuck is this? Yeah. It's like it's just been taken away and plotted up on another planet and nothing else really mattered. Yeah. But had some great times in there and future. Um, I think at the time as well, I was um, still doing the glazing. And I think I was still... I had to go and work up at um, oh, the film studios out in Buckinghamshire. Um, oh, Shepparton. Shepparton? That's the one. Yeah. And um, I was there up a ladder, all fucking ticks, trying to fix a window in the canteen there. And um, I met Charlton Eston there. <laughs> I don't know what I said. I said something stupid to him um, and a few other styles but like I can remember like still being off me nut coming into work the next morning and um, talking to the people in the cafe the greasy spoon and everything and probably one of the best times of my life well one of them what <laughs> set us on the road to um, with a more debauched lifestyle <laughs> So when did it was that did you when did you meet Liam and his brother then? Oh the first time I met Liam and Des, um I was with um it was a party down at Kingston, some big private house. Yeah. And I was sitting right at the back of this garden with Maisie. Um I think Phil Dirtbox was there. Johnny O and a couple of others. And Steve knew them. And he said, oh, here's Liam and, and Joe come up. And my first thought was, to be honest with you, I thought, oh, look at these power things. <laughs> it didn't sort of seem to fit in with us. So, <clears throat> yeah. Made a relationship with them now. And the first time I really got on with them was um, Gary Aisman's club a couple of weeks later in the raid at Shaftesbury Avenue. Yeah. Sitting in the rubber plant, fucking making monkey noises all night. <laughs> 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 and Liam's come over so I met you the other week at that party in um, Kingston yeah yeah and we just got talking then and that was so uh, uh, really sort of cracked on with Des and Liam I think we spent most of the night in the rubber plant making monkey noises and that's when they was telling me about setting up the um, band and everything I said fuck it oh. Uh, Liam said, do you want a bit? I said, I can't fucking do nothing. I said, I can sing, I can't play nothing and everything. And um, we arranged, I think we went, met up with him the following week. And um, I could remember coming home one off my tits. I had one of those little flower things with a guitar. Yeah. Little flower pot thing. And he push it and go, yeah. So I was talking to Liam the following week. I said, I know what I can do. I was showing him the picture of it. I said, look, I can be that. And that's how it evolved into um, dancing with a flower, like a f***ing retard. <laughs> but you had a lot of fun, didn't you? Ah, oh, yeah, great, great times, great times. It was truly excess of everything. Yeah. We'd always push the boundaries a bit further and a bit further. Um, there was some great, so I think... Me, Des and Liam, we, we were the ones, what, like, once we, we got on it, we, we were just like, we were unstoppable. 
I just needed a little kick up the bollocks to start causing as much trouble as possible. And she got in me DNA. I just left total chaos. <laughs> I think if I read about it from other other members, it, it was it was you that caused the chaos. Yeah, I just needed a little flick, and then I, and I was just full on. <laughs> It was just getting out of London and just causing as much grief as possible. Yeah. From all over Europe to um, even just being on my own, I just wanted to fucking just have a laugh and just cause as much grief as possible. Yeah. But that, they, they must have been great times back then to, to build the band up, you know, to yeah. the level that it got. I, I can remember Leon saying to me, he said, as soon as we stop having fun, we will call it a day. Um, and I think towards the end, from, from what was going on, I think enough was enough, and which, which caused the demise of the band and what have you. But prior to that, um, the stories, what we used to get up to, um, think, one of them in your favourite town of Middlesbrough. <laughs> um, I think, what's it called? Havana, the Havana Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And prior to that, We've been having like fucking water fights, egg fights with the roadies and the tour, um, the band and rest of the um tour group and everything. It was just like pulled into service station, loading vehicles up with trays and trays of eggs and water guns and flour. So each time we've been going off about three days and we arrived at the Havana Club and um, the band are um, sound checking everything. So I managed to get upstairs into the office barricaded the doors and there was a big open balcony. So at this time I had loads of trays of eggs up there and flour and I was hanging over the balcony and just aiming eggs at everybody you could think of. Like They couldn't get into the office by the barricaded the door and most of the office chairs and tables that I threw out the street. <laughs> the old bill turned up um, and they didn't nick anyone. Um, the owners of the club were quite a heavy little firm. A little lot not to f*** about with. In the end, they said, no, we're not f***ing paying you going f*** off. Like, you're lucky you're getting out of here without a slap. Um, but I think prior to that as well, we played Glasgow. Sort of another water, water fight thing. And um, Terry McQuaid sort of banged on his door. And he's seen me with the fire extinguisher hose. And as he's seen me, he shut the door roll but I couldn't turn the tap um, the tap off to stop the water flow so for about 10 minutes it's going full blast into his hotel room alright and all of a sudden the geezer the receptionist have come walking up the stairs they said look oh, what's going on can you turn the water off I said I can't turn it off he said there's all water coming through the ceiling and McQuaid's room was above the um, reception <laughs> I thought I was <laughs> so I walked down with the um, hotel manager and I've never seen nothing like it I thought it'd just be drips of water coming through it was like a scene from 40 Towers Raw it was just a waterfall picking through the ceiling <laughs> and the old bill was called there as well and I give him his dues and manager said look as long as he's not uh, out of here in 30 minutes I won't press charges we'd already been thrown out of two hotels that same day um, and there was a TUC meeting going on in Glasgow. All the hotels are fully booked. So we ended up with the tour bus plotted up in a big field. And the boys have bought all these sausages for a fucking barbecue and just want to be sensible. I've nicked the petrol for the, um, from the barbecue, just running around in pitch black, pouring petrol everywhere and setting these fires. And all of a sudden, they've come running over to try and put them out. Then on the other side of the field, all these other bushes will be going up. <laughs> Um, fucking great days. Um, there's another time in, in Germany <clears throat> we played on um, the docks on the Reaper farm. Yeah. So the deal was we've, we've done the gig and everything, <clears throat> and me and Dad stayed behind to collect the money. But prior to that, we've been to the hotel and emptied all the bar, all the boys, all the um, road crew, put all their mini bar into our road. And we thought, we're having all the drink. So we got paid. We sent all the others back to the hotel. And um, me and Des are down the red light district. Uh, yeah. 
I think that gig was about, I can't remember how much money it was, but it weren't that much. So we got into one of the knocking shops and uh, we got these two brasses, like, Des is probably one. I said, oh, f- it, I don't want to, her nose was like a fucking parrot. But I thought, oh, why not? So um, they took us up into the room and then we gave them all the, all the salary we got for that gig that night. We handed it all over to them. So there was a little bed that side and one on the other side. And me and Des said, right, okay, we'll strip start bollock naked that we just keep our shoes on, our trainers on. And um, the girls went out to go and get undressed and what happened. So like, when they come back in, we are freaked out of them, right? Like, so as, <laughs> as they've come back in, they've seen me and Des standing on the bed, bollock naked. Then we started jumping across each other's bed, making monkey noises and everything. Scared the shit out of them. They must have pushed a panic alarm. These five big security fellas have come up, picked me and Des up, all that clobber, threw us out down his side road, bollock naked, and then we had to explain to the band where the salary was. <laughs> <laughs> it was just one thing after the next. Um, what else was there? Um... Yeah, so... <laughs> So, so when when did the band split up then, and you know the 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 reasoning behind it? Right, our our last gig was um, Madness Finsby Park. Yeah, yeah. We should have been on stage at four o'clock. Right, by this time Liam's fucking heroin addiction had cracked right in. Yeah. Right. Tim asked. I think it was quarter past four, actually found him in the porter cabin with a set of works hanging out of his arm, fucking completely f- away with the fairies, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And more or less, Tim, the brains behind the fan, and he was really pissed off, like, and um, I think was, he wasn't turning up for uh, rehearsals. It was just like, yeah. sometimes I'd only beat Tim there. And he got really pissed off, and I think that was the last now in the coffin was the Finsby Park one, and they yeah. killed it after that. Yeah. Um, yeah. There wasn't any going back. Um, Joe, um, I would say 90% of the band were all about with the smack and what have you. Yeah. And it just took a hold over everything, took priority. Yeah. Um, there'd be times I where whatever money would come in from any gigs or anything, yeah. uh, or when we'd go away on tour, there'd always be enough money or enough sort of stock of smack to get everyone through the tour. Yeah. And um, where Tim wasn't into that sort of thing, I can understand it fucked him right off. And yeah. to me, he was the brains behind it all. Yeah. And once he left, it just it went tits up after that. Yeah. Shame, but... Um, it was only going to go one way once yeah. I got hold of him. But that, um, that would have, that would have been when Chelsea started getting a bit of success. No, and that was ninety two. We didn't really get any success. Ninety four was the first time we won the FA Cup yeah. in twenty seven years. Yeah. Um. Ninety three, the first trophy I see us win, which, which I thought was great, was a cross channel trophy against Le Havre in pre season. But you, you, never saw, you, you never saw the Zenith data against yes, Middlesbrough? Yes, Zenith data. The first one was Man City at Wembley. Yeah. Then we had yeah. you lot the following season. Yeah. And that, those were massive trophies for us then. Yeah, yeah. Apart yeah. from, I've, I've seen lift the second division championship. And I thought, that's as far as we go. Um, I can remember when I got married, saying to me, Mrs. I was saying, listen, look. Got married in 89. I said, if Chelsea ever get to Europe, if it means divorcing you, like, I'm going. She said, you shit, you're never going to get to Europe. But I knew she was right. And I, it was 94, we lost the cup final to the Manx 4 0. But where they won the league, yeah. we qualified for the Cup Winners' Cup. And I was over the moon, said, hey, you can divorce me, I want you, mate. And we're off to Prague. <laughs> <laughs> There was one uh, flowered up story that I forgot, the Black East story. Oh, yeah. The mansion. Yeah. The mansion where you're working on this mansion and uh, the, the owners give you the keys. Well, 
I was still doing the glazing then, Will, and I, yeah. I used to cover all South East London for this company, and I got called to the estate agent down at Blackheath Village. Yeah. So I went and picked the keys up, and this, the estate agent would not stop going on about this house. So the house has all this and all that and everything. It's worth about four mil then it was. Yeah. That was in 91. So I said, look, give me the keys. I went round there. It was only a small little window. So I said, look, it's a special type of glass. I'll have to come back tomorrow. So I said, leave me the keys and I'll drop them back when I'm finished. So um, to get a bit of extra money, I boarded the window up. I got another 95 quid out of that. <laughs> and on leaving it, I drove round and got a spare set of keys cut. So next day, went back, fixed the window and um, called Des and Liam. And my mate Stanley, Gary Stanley, and took him there over the weekend. And it belonged to a fella called Terry Ramsden, who was um, done for a big fraud a carousel case. Um, yeah. Multi-million pound. He had the house seized off him. And he was a year off or he was in jail. So we sit and think, okay, what should we do? And um, girls think we should have a party here. So we started putting things in motion. I said, right, well, we'll have to squat it a week before to make sure that we've got proper, um, um, what's it called, um, squatting lights on it. So our lighting man, Pete the Feet, I said, look, Pete, <clears throat> I think it was a couple of days after, after we decided to have the party. We left it a month before we um, decided to have the party to get it all prepared and everything. So... I think within the first two weeks, I arranged to meet Peter Feet down at um, Blackheath Village. Picked him up from the station. Prior to that, I drove round there early on the day, put a ladder up and sprayed all the expanding foam into the alarm system. Yeah, yeah. Went and picked him up from the station. I had a locksmith there, changed the locks. So walking around the house and everything, I said, right, Pete, we're in here now. And I found this, what I thought was a walkie-talkie thing. And I pushed the button, it was a fucking panic alarm. And about 10 minutes later, we were in bang, bang, bang on the door. It was the old Bill that's turned up. So I've answered the door and said, what are you doing here? I said, look, I accidentally pushed his a panic alarm. I said, I didn't realise what it was. He said, well, what are you doing here? I said, I've got squatters' rights, mate. And I showed him the receipt from the um, locksmiths. I said, I've had the locks changed and everything. He said, OK, look, I've got to walk around the building and check that you've had no sign of breaking an entry. I said, well, fair enough. So he's walked around and he said, well, sorry, lads, and there's nothing I can do. I can just leave it for you now. And that was it. So um, a week before the party, I got Gary, Johnny, me, and oh, and Pete the feet to squat it. Staying there till it was secure, and we told a couple of the neighbours that like, we were um, um, a film company. We're going to make a video here, so it kept them off by. Um, Tommy, you used to do our um, security for the band. He owned a pub as well, so I let him set up the bar there. I said, Tom, look, don't want a percentage. Just set up your bar. You can take what you want. I've got his um, brother to do the door. We'd done a thousand tickets up, sold them for a cockle each. Um, the sound system, um, I think we had Paul Ogie, Farley, Steve Lee, and a couple um, other sort of DJ playing all for the night. Yeah. But I can remember the night of the party, um, seven o'clock it was, Tommy's vans turned up for the, with all the booze and everything. And we started unloading all the trucks for the booze, and the old bills turned up. I thought, oh, that's all we need. Um, but they had reports that we were nicking all the furniture out of there. I said, no, nah, listen, look, come and check. Look, we're just unloading all the booze and everything. So I said, oh, OK, sorry, lads, and just left us to it. Um, and then it sort of kicked off at 9 o'clock, and I was thinking... It can't go on much longer than this. I thought every hour the old bill was going to come back and come back, but there were so many people in there. I think by one o'clock, most of the ticket holders were in there who bought yeah. tickets. And uh, I forget his name, the doorman. He said, Baz, look, 
can our lot have the money on the door whoever turns up next? So I said, yeah, it's, it's no problem. But I think another thousand people turn up. And by this time, the place was rocking. And I think the old Bill had enough of it about three o'clock Sunday afternoon. And um, the place was completely fucking terrorised. Um, and all I can remember was the police turning up and, and the estate agent as well standing in the doorway with his head in his hands like this type. Most of us got out for the back and over the uh, rear gardens had it on our toes that night. Just seeing his face with his head in his hands. One minute he's lording his place up to be fucking worth four or five mil. <laughs> we left it probably needing about four or five mil worth of renovations to sort it back out again. <laughs> Did they catch up with you? No, no. Um, we made it clear to the journalists, no photos or no f shit in the newspapers. But that Linda Duff from the Daily Star. Yeah. The cheeky. Put it on page three the next day, the whole story. So I rang him up. I said, oh, you fat. You were fucking told. No media coverage or nothing. I go, you f I lost my temper with her. Then the next thing, she put the old bill on me, trying to nick me for threats to kill. Um, I've not really spoke to her since then, but she was always wanting to do interviews with the um, band members yeah. and everything. She, I think she had a buzz for a bit of riffraff and whatever, a bit of yeah. little causing trouble, but she pissed me off in the end. There was a little bit in the sun... Um, which weren't too bad. He didn't name anything about where the place was, how we received the keys. But that put everything on page three, almost everything down to a T. Um, that, nah, never, uh, never even um, got no trouble over it. They couldn't really do us for anything anyway. Squatters' yeah. rights and like, yeah. it was our house, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually caught up with this Terry Ramsden who owned the house about a year ago. I was speaking to me pal in Dubai. He lives in Dubai now, this Terry Ramston. Oh, and yeah. um, my mate Queer Mickey, he does a lot of money stuff, money movements. And um, I'm talking to him, he said, oh, hold it. I, said, I just got my mate Terry calling me. I said, oh. And he called me back and said, I old mate Terry Ramston, I was in jail with and everything. I said, what? Terry Rams and the race course, race horse trainer. He, he was a director of Walsall Football Club as well. Yeah. He said, yeah. I goes, how do you know him? And sort of cut a long story short. So I sent him a load of photos from the house. And um, I've got them on a text reply and everything. Well, I, I dig them out, I forge them to you. Yeah. Like. <laughs> um, and I met his brother once. He had a car front down um, Ilford, a BMW garage, his brother. So... A small well. Yeah, I think yeah. it's Terry Round now. He's he's made his money back. He's a big money mover in, in the sand. Um, he's got to be touching seventy five now. Yeah, yeah. But the money I earned out of that paid for um, another trip to Thailand over Christmas with the missus and the kids. We didn't earn that much money out of it once we shared it all out. The DJs earned more than what we did. But it was just a bit of fun. Something what you would if you spent. A year trying to plan that, it would never come off. It was just one of those yeah. things, fuck it, spur the moment, and let's see if it works. And, yeah. and manage to pull it off in the end. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't touch a fucking one bit of gear or drug that night. I was on me fucking straight and out to pay everyone off. Yeah. How did it, because you moved into gentlemen's magazines after that. How did that come about? Right. That came about, I um, started doing a distribution for Time Out. And the company what I was doing it for, they had a big porn um, distribution bit as well, which they left alone, just died off. And the boss of that, he gave me a fold of about 500 shops. And he said, Baz, see if you can go and um, get this back up and running. And um, so he said, look, you can use all these magazines for a soft, soft pole. And I thought, fuck it, that's not going to fucking get me anywhere. 
He said, but all these hardcore porn ones you can't use because they're for export only. They're coming from South Africa and America. I thought, I've got to earn a few quid. <clears throat> so I started using all the fucking hardcore porn, putting in all the shops. And I built it, built the round back up, and it was, took over his um, distribution round and everything. So his son-in-law, Billy Cook, he said, Baz, look, he said, you've done, built this round right back up and everything. He said, um, how do you feel like setting up on your own? I said, Bill, I ain't got enough money for that. He said, don't worry, I'll front it. Um, I said, go and look for some warehouses. I said, okay, I'll, I'll look for some on, on, near me ass and set up a warehouse just behind Millwall Football Club. Yeah. And um, he's a cheeky fucker, Bill, but he said, they front all the money. But what he'd done, we had a load of um, American porn coming into the company I was working for. He rang up the company in the States and got it diverted to the new warehouse. So he more or less, he's robbed about 20 grand's worth of magazines. And, and that's how we started up. Um, we got to a stage um, where we become probably the biggest importers of hardcore Paul magazines, well, gentleman magazines, or let's get it correct, sexual education magazines. <laughs> and you had some big companies like um, the Gold, who owned Burnham at the time. Yeah. Um, Paul Raymond. And um, the only way to get forward in this game is to, was they was importing magazines with all the black dots in. Yeah, yeah. Censored. So we was importing all the hardcore stuff and without the black dots. So one of our first court cases, we got sued by the Golds and everything, and um, Sullivan's. Yeah, yeah. And they took the eye call, um, and we had them by the balls because they said they had sole distribution rights and for the UK only, for these American titles. Uh, the eye court judge threw it out because they was buying the Canadian version so yeah. a little, little sort of, um, small thing like that, we won that case. So then we had a big one with Paul Raymond. Yeah. We do club, yeah. men only, main yeah. fair, just soft porn ones. So yeah. we was importing the um, hardcore versions of club, the American versions. I can remember this one day, um, got a call in the office and um, the fella said to me, oh, I'm looking at um, setting up a shop in Gatwick Airport, selling hardcore magazines. So I said, oh, one second, I pull it on hold. I said, oh, Bill, I think we can set up again in Sullivan and Golds. I said, look, this... <clears throat> he can, um, one second, she's got a swig of beer, me folks. He said, um, was... I thought this ain't right, setting up a pawn shop in the Gatwick Airport, because only Smiths can do that, WH Smiths, but they can only sell the soft pawn with, with covers over the um, magazines. Yeah. So I said, um, yeah, I can help you out. Played him along. And he said, look, I'm off to the States in a couple of weeks, and I'll call you when I get back. <laughs> well, with this game, if you want to do a trade, they either come to your warehouse or you go to their shop. So he's um, called me, on this meeting to the Tower Thistle Hotel at Tower Bridge. And I knew it was a setup straight away. Yeah. But unbeknown to me at the time, it was trying to entice me to sell him the titles what Paul Raymond wanted. For, they wanted to do us for copyright. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. So at the time he's interviewing me, he had a secret camera, a microphone and everything. And he's asking me about, I knew he didn't have a clue what he was talking about. So he was asking me what titles we were allowed to sell. And I was just making silly names up. Oh, Sally Big Tits Volume 1 and all shit like that. So he said, oh, can I come down to your warehouse and pick up some samples? I said, yeah, no problem. Um, he's come down to one of the warehouses. Um, gave him magazines what we were allowed to sell and not on a copyright sort of turnout. Yeah. Gave him a snide invoice as well from a company in Germany. So he didn't hear no more from him. And now it all come on top was a shop in Soho called Seymour Books. 
uh, Steve Mendoza, the grass in. His landlord was Paul Raymond. Yeah. And we were supplying them all the American versions and they've clocked it in the shop. Cut a long story short, they've issued me and Bill um, high court issues for copyright infringement. Yeah. So um, this took about 18 months to resolve. Um, in the end, they were spending too much money. We was losing a lot of money with solicitors and we had to sign an affidavit saying that we will no longer import American versions of Club Club International, um, Club Explicit and a few other narrow titles. As we're signing it in the high court in front of the judge, we still had two containers on the wall coming from the States. We still carried on with that for about a year later and they knew Paul Raymond couldn't stop us. Yeah. So they called us in the office down at um, Archer Street, yeah. Um, so I yeah. sat the deal with them saying that, um, okay, we'll be allowed to borrow your back numbers from the States. Okay, we'll do that, but no older than six months. Um, so sign that. The magazine weren't worth it then. We absolutely yeah. flooded the market for 10 years with it. Yeah. And um, in the end, we signed that with them. Eventually, a couple of years down the line, they just never bothered us with us again. Even was important the latest editions, they just couldn't move it. Yeah. So other magazines moved on. Um, I thought that was a job for life. Done that for... Um, up until I got nicked away, 12 years. But it changed, didn't it? The internet changed it. Yeah, the internet changed it. Give you an example. I've been to you and buy 50,000 hardcore DVDs. I'd be getting 15 quid from them in the sex shops around Soho and around the country. They'd only last a month. Then up until 2008, I could buy a 1,000 of those DVDs for a euro and be lucky to get seven quid for them. It just killed it. Yeah. Um, all this free internet on the... Um, well, it's just free everywhere now, isn't it? That's what yeah. killed that game. And yeah. I speak to my mates in the States now and again who's still in this game. And um, at our peak, you'll import 200 different titles a month from the States, monthly. Yeah. That's gone down to 50 now, and they're printed bi-monthly. So yeah. I think the mag as we move into magazine, um, who buys magazines these days? No yeah. one. Newspapers, sort of, it's, it's killed it all. Yeah, yeah. But it is, it is because it then. Yeah, but then, and then you know, you uh, you had a bit of time in prison, which has been documented in newspapers, national newspapers, and that, that's kind of like because I helped you out with your your blog. Of uh, your time in prison before the 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 the, the governor got wind of it and uh, decided it was a bit too hot for memory. No, I pulled the plug on it because the yeah. girl that was doing it, she thought it'd be a good idea to sort of like do a, a prison blog. Yeah. So I got f***ed off with her because I I was getting these letters out and telling her a lot more than what was publicised, and right. she was censoring so much of it. And she yeah. was saying, listen, bro, look, people think you're going to be a horrible person. I said, I fucking am an horrible person. Just print what I'm writing. <laughs> About 80% of it was censored. And I thought, oh, this. why am I doing it? So I just pulled the plug. Right. I could have carried it on and on and on. But yeah, she yeah. decided to put her own little bit in it. Yeah. It was a lot more. About 90% of it was made up. Well, not made up, but she cut a lot of it out. Yeah. I, said, I, did, I, I didn't know that. And I said, look, I can't understand why you're cutting out. You asked me to do it. I'm telling you how it really is in there. Yeah. And um, she said, oh, people are going to make out you an awful person. I said, well, fucking am. It doesn't matter to me. And I had one of the funniest times in my life in jail. Really yeah. had a great time in there. Like, yeah. Every day was like, um, you was laughing your bollocks off. Like, it was about 80% of people in there just low-life scumbags. But then the other 20% are some really nice people just Got caught for just got just got caught doing good things and um sort of cracked on with them, but um uh, I've never laughed so much in my life. When I come out, my mum said to me, she said, "Was well, you just keeping me spirits up, telling me you was having a good time?" Was you? I said, "No." I said, "Honestly, mum, 
I had one of the funniest times in my life. I met some really good people in there. Um, two good friends, two old boys, um, Howard and Gideon, look well out of place. Yeah. Um, Gideon was 58, um, Howard was in his early 60s. Looked like a couple of nonces. Like, didn't look like being jail at all. And how I got talking to them was that like, I was on a landing one day and Gideon was talking to some guy about, was he, he was Israeli, and talking about Auschwitz. So I butted and said, oh, sorry, Gideon. I said, oh, I heard you speaking about Auschwitz and everything. I said, I, I feel your pain and everything. I said, my granddad died in there. He said, ah, oh. I said, my old family was shocked. Like, he said, he was on, I said, yeah, he come back pissed from the boozer one night and fell out, pissed out of his watchtower. <laughs> and that broke the ice with him. Yeah. So, for the next three and a half years, I looked after Howard and Gideon. Yeah. They were a pair of two international gun smugglers. Yeah. Uh, um, proper sort of involved in everything. Make, they make that Lord of War, that Nicolas Cage movie, look like a kindergarten movie. <laughs> Um, they asked me to help them out on their appeal as their lawyer stitched them up. Um, they got banged up on the, um, such a minute little thing. They used to do a lot of work for the British government. Yeah. And they were supplying arms to the Tamil Tigers. And they had a big arms shipment leaving um, Madagascar or somewhere like that. And they were under pressure from the British government to supply the Tamil Tigers double quick, but you need a, a, a special license to before you can ship anything out. Yeah. So because they was under pressure from the British government, they decided to um, oh, we we'll ship it out before the fucking license comes. So they got nicked on that. Um, they went to court expecting a slap on the wrist. Um, Gideon got a nine. And Howard got a seven um, for arms, uh, illegal arms dealing. So they've asked me like, to help them out with a good lawyer. So I spoke to my lawyer and everything. And he sent me their court papers back. And the list of charges where they've supplied weapons to was just like, <laughs> and I, I give it to him. I said, look, it's going to be hard work. Um, but it just shows you like, the sort of people you meet in there. Yeah, and I've kept in contact with them all the time. Um, yeah. Funny enough, I, I meet a lot of Israelis out here. I've got a good Israeli <coughs> friend here. And I was telling him about it. He said, oh, I know him. He said, Gideon, his father was actually um, head of the Israeli FA as well. Um, what I do when we're offline, I'll send you a little, uh, the links about them and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Really nice couple of guys they are. Yeah. Um, going back to Howard, like um, Howard, Howard was the main investor, and Gideon would travel around the world buying all his um, weapons up. Um, so about a year ago, I emailed um, Howard. I was offered something called um, a uranium, uranium nine point zero or something, or some fucking. Um, a tonic bomb shit like. And I, I, I sent him an email. He said, where the f*** have you got that from? I said, oh, just don't have my pals off it to me. He said, you don't send me an email like that again. He said, you're going to get me f***ing it. I said, well, what is it? He goes, it's something to do with making dirty bombs. And I don't know how my mate got hold of it. He's a chemistry teacher in one of the private schools here. Right. So I've just, uh, some of the stuff you get offered here or what crops up, which is amazing. I've but he's kind of like one of one of the stories I remember is you started playing badminton. Yeah, every day in jail, um, played badminton. Um, gym in the morning, gym at night. Played with the screws during lunchtime, and um, towards the end of the sentence, um, he come on me wing. Um, the gold bullion fella, um, he's just been released. Oh, who killed the geezer as well, stabbed him up. Um, Kenneth Noy. Kenneth Noy. 
That's him, Kenneth Noyle. Yeah, yeah. Come on me wing. And uh, he was shit out at tennis and badminton. And my mate knew him from one of the other jails who was with him. So he'd come on and he introduced me to him. I said, oh, listen, Ken, I heard you're a little bit hot fucking badminton. I said, I'll give you a game. I said, here's the deal. If you beat me, I'll give you a couple tins of tuna. But if I, if, yeah, if you beat me, I'll give you a couple tins of tuna. But if I beat you, I want one of your bullion bars, all right? <laughs> it was good stuff. I think he's just been releasing to DCAT now, or well, he might even be out completely. But he was 72, I think, when he came on at the wing. But he was as fit as a butcher's dog, he was. Right? Because that's all he can do anymore, unless he's gym. Yeah. Yeah. And then when I come out, I joined about six badminton clubs. So I was playing badminton all week, um, joined one club, even won a gold medal. Started playing over here. But you're not, and got too busy, didn't really find the time to. I've not played now for four years. No, yeah. hold it a second. 2016. Fuck me, seven years. Uh, really did enjoy that. It kept you fit and what have you. But I was just too busy now to even do a bit of decent shopping. There's always something cropping up. Was that when you left? Was, it, was that the last time I saw you then, 2016? Last time you would have seen me would have been... Um, It was that gig at uh, Eccles' pub, wasn't it? 2013 would have been the last time you saw me. Right. I think the last do I went to was that Mia Casa. Mia Casa ran about um, November. Right. 2013. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the last time I've sort of been, been in the UK. Yeah. And then you, you ended up in Thailand. Yeah. The last ten, the next ten years. Yeah. Running uh, some smut clubs. <laughs> and now you've got a young kid. Yeah, that's a mad one. I was with my bird here for nine years, and I had a bit on the side, sort of juggling the two. And then when she told me she's loaded up, I thought, wow. Oh, this, like, I'm too old for this, like, so, but I said, look, don't worry, I, I thought I could juggle the both, like, so I sent one home to the, back up north, so, and one was down here, the, the proper missus, I was travelling up and down during COVID and everything, giving it a load, of, oh, I've got to go over to Lau to do a bit of business, but the nosy, stuck her nose in and everything, and I managed to keep it quiet, the pregnancy and everything, and then to, uh, Luca's two and a quarter now, she found out, not this Christmas, last Christmas, the proper missus. So we're finished now. Yeah. So I'm with, with the um, son and the little one. But um, it's good. Um, you have to, get to spend a lot more time with the kids growing up now. Whereas before with my other daughters, back yeah. home it was hard in the UK. You're working just yeah. to put food on the table. And the yeah. only time you really saw them was at the weekends if you weren't working. Yeah. But here, he's with me all the time. Um, don't really start work till half past nine at night. Um, I won't be working tonight, but it looks like the electric's gone down in the club. Don't know why. Yeah. Um, I can have enough, like, a night off tonight. Um, but during the days with us, we're two minutes walk from the beach. It's a lovely place to grow up. Um, yeah. And having him sort of calm me down a lot more. Impossible. Well, a, a bit. <laughs> is, it, is there a lot of tourists coming out to Pattaya now? You know, because the last three years has been a bit... Yeah, I think the last two years during COVID, I mean, it's just me and my dog here. That's how right. bad it was. Yeah. But now, um, we're back to probably more busy now than the two years prior to COVID. Yeah. Um, a majority of tourists here at the moment, I would say... 60% of them are Russians. Okay. Um, my customer base is built up... Um, my customer base is built up with about 50% Japanese, Korean, 
and Chinese, uh, 10% Russian, um, another 10% Europeans, and a mixture of everyone. Um, yeah. I'd rather have Korean and Japanese in the club because they're spending way much more money than everyone else. They're just happy to sit there, buy the girls' drinks and have a bit of fun. Whereas you've got your um, sex tourists, which are hardly ever about that. They just want to come in, cheap drink, and want to f- shag, but it don't happen in our place. Yeah. It's more or less just like an um, expensive lap dancing club. Yeah. Um, but it's... it's um, the place I'm there now is, is pretty professional. Prior to COVID, my club like it used to make that bar in Sopranos, the um what was that bar called now? Um the Butter Bean Club in Sopranos. Yeah. yeah. That looked like a pussy club to our place. I like, some of the stories what used to go on in there, I um would make a movie alone. Um going non stop. Um Um, summer stuff. I'd have the police in there every New Year's Eve, like doing pills, MD, sniffing everything. Um, it was just a madhouse. Um, I'd have it was a bit, a little bit filthy in there as well. Like you'd have in all these little VIP tables, and all of a sudden you look down and there'd be a little, there'd be a girl's head bobbing up and down, giving someone a nosh, or you'd have big. Stick on dildo, sticking on the tables, or the birds riding them. It, oh, people getting chopped up in there. It was it was mad. Yeah. Um, a lot of people come up to me and said, "Baz, that was the best club we've ever been to." Like, no matter what what you could get away with, we managed to do it. Like, um, I remember the first time we had a license. Well, not a license. The old Bill said to us, "Look, you can close at seven o'clock, but keep the noise down." Um, so walking straight, most of the bars shut there at four o'clock. Seven o'clock, I'll get a call from the police saying, we told you to keep the noise down. I thought, well, it is down. I've come out and you could hear it from one end of the um, street down to the next side. Um, just pay me a little bit extra. But it was one of those places like, where, where anything could go. Anything could happen. Like, um <sighs> There's a lot of stuff I won't tell you. Get nicked for that. I'm, I'm in the sort of area. I can imagine. I think quite about a few things. I can imagine. Thank you very much, Barry uh, Mooncult, for your time. And uh... oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure, mate. I hope I ain't said too much to offend your customers. <laughs>